Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're talking about protein. I'm really excited. I think chapter four, talking about fat, is a great segue uh, for getting us prepped and ready to talk about protein further. All right, so some learning objectives. Compare and contrast the nutrients in animal and plant sources of protein, including examples of complementary protein. Explain how proteins are digested, absorbed, and used in the body. List types and health benefits of vegetarian diets and plan nutritionally adequate vegetarian meals. Explain the dietary recommendations for protein, including the consequences of eating too much or too little protein. And prepare and present creative and healthy menu dishes using meat, poultry, and fish. All right, so introduction, always good to say, what do we mean when we say protein? So proteins are the nutrients in all living cells and animals and plants that have important roles, okay? We're gonna continue to go further than that. Um, one thing that I want you to remember, particularly for the test, is that proteins are long chains of amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So we're gonna have, I'm gonna have a picture about on that, just so you see what I mean. So protein's big, amino acids are small, and our body puts together, the amino acids are found in foods when we also have amino acids in our body. It's kind of like Legos or like Lincoln, Lincoln Logs. Um, your body can take what amino acids are available and put them together in different sequence combinations and they create different proteins. These proteins are found in your hair, skin, muscles, blood, nails, and all throughout your cells. Whereas carbohydrates and lipid are used mostly to give you sources of energy, protein functions to build and maintain your body. So this is really important. I want you to also remember this for the test, that protein is the nutrient most important for building and repairing tissues in your body. All right, so I was talking about amino acids. So there are such a thing as essential and non-essential. Let's start with non-essential. Non-essential amino acids means that our body can make these amino acids naturally. However, essential amino acids means that they are essential and must be acquired from food. So essential amino acids are amino acids that either cannot be made in the body or can't be made in the quantities needed. So we must get them from food. Animal versions of protein, which include beef, chicken, and dairy, have more protein per ounce than plant foods. Typically, like on average, 20 grams in per three ounces of meat, poultry, or fish, um, or even eight grams in one cup of milk. So when we're talking about a healthy diet, we want to make sure there's a good combination or ratio of carbohydrates to protein to fat. So animal proteins, uh, if you will, if you're someone who's not vegetarian, is just a really quick, simple way of getting um, protein. Um, so that's that's one benefit another um, however if you are not if you are a vegetarian or vegan uh, you can still get proteins uh, you're just gonna have to get them from different sources and you'll just need to eat more uh, higher quantity and or, or more often to get the amount of protein that you need but it's definitely doable and we'll talk about that in that chapter among plant foods legumes and nuts are very good sources of protein typically providing six to eight grams of protein per serving Grains and veggies have some protein as well, uh, typically on the lower end, but they do have some, three to four grams per serving, and even some fruits contain a little bit of protein. This is just a nice picture, colorful to summarize, different, um, basically the, from what the last slide went over, it's a nice little summary in this picture. So quick review on fat, again, drawing from chapter four. Most plant foods have little to no saturated fat, so this is a benefit of increasing our diet with plant foods. Nuts and seeds contain fat, but it's mostly healthy fats, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids. Most fish and shellfish contain small amounts of fat. Even fatty fish, such as salmon, are close to chicken breasts, which is skinless, that is, in fat and saturated fat. Pork tenderloin is actually um, a lean protein, and I provided the website in case you wanted to check out different cuts of pork and the nutri nutrition that they provide. And then most of the fat in seafood is good fat, meaning polyunsaturated. All right, so animal proteins uh, cont uh, typically contain all the essential amino acids that we need. 
Um, so they are referred to as complete proteins. And then plant sources of protein are considered incomplete, but that's okay because if you can mix and match different combinations, you can get a complete protein. We're gonna talk about that in the next couple of slides. So incomplete proteins, um, examples, plant proteins, except for soybeans and quinoa, we talk about that. Um, dried beans and peas and grains, vegetables, nuts and seeds. So if you're someone who's vegetarian or vegan, you can get protein from these sources. Like I said, you'll just have to increase the quantity, the amount of these foods that you eat per day. So a complementary protein is another term that we use. So a complementary protein is uh, when you combine two protein food, uh, foods to make up for the lack of certain amino acids in the other when eaten over the course of the day. So we're going to go over some examples of what complementary proteins are, but basically that's you taking two plant proteins typically that don't have all of the essential amino acids but when you put them together and eat them together they do actually have um, they can create a complete protein so here are some examples because i know that's kind of wordy it, these are great examples so if you're someone who's vegetarian or vegan this is how you create a complete protein so on their own legumes and grains or legumes and nuts and seeds or legumes and um and dairy for example on their own separate they would have some essential amino acids, but not all of them. If you start combining them, especially particularly in uh, meals, then you've got a complete protein. So it is possible to get the right amount of protein that your body needs eating a vegetarian or vegan diet. So one thing that I want you to remember for the test is this table. So please review it, go through it, and remember that when you pair legumes with grains or legumes with nuts and seeds or legumes with dairy, um, then this is an example of a complete protein. So um, you'll pro you probably see there, but a good example would be a combination of beans and rice, for example, would be a complete protein. But do get familiar with this table and do feel very comfortable with thinking about complementary proteins because this will come up on the test. Um, and fun fact, soybeans and the protein in soybean products such as soy milk and tofu actually contain complete protein. So that's the exception. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, make if you can, make tofu your best friend. <laughs> All right, so proteins that you eat are broken down into single amino acids during digestion and then used by your cells to make new proteins. That's why I called them Legos because separated, they're just standalone, but then you put them together to make something new. An amino acid pool in the body provides amino acids the cells need. If an amino acid is not available to build a protein, then a protein cannot be made. So that's why it's important that we're getting all of our essential amino acids from foods um, so that we, our body can um, build and repair any tissues or cells that they need to in the body. Um, yes, okay, and then in case you're interested, part of protein um, that's very important is uh, what, what's in your genes and is part of your DNA. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about digestion absor and absorption, so breaking the proteins down and being able to absorb them. This slide is very important for the test. So there's a process called denaturation. Let's see if I have that in, I believe I have that in another slide, but I'm gonna go over it in this slide. It's gonna come up again, but I want you to remember that for the test. Okay, so Denaturation is this process that's happening in the stomach. When, the, when protein enters the stomach, the stomach acid helps uncoil the proteins, um, start basically breaking, breaking them apart, so enzymes can start separating the amino acids. So I want you to remember that protein digestion occurs in the stomach. And what I want you to remember as well as the word denaturation, which is the term for uncoiling the protein and I want you to remember that denaturation happens in the stomach and I want you to remember that particular for the test. Alright so enzymes uh, in the small intestine enzymes further break down the proteins into single amino acids and amino acids can travel in the blood to the liver and this is just a nice little example of another way of thinking about it. 
So when you eat a protein, they come into the body, your stomach starts to uncoil and break the amino acids down. Um, and then your enzymes as well start to, in your small intestine, start to further break down those proteins. And so they're breaking them apart and then this allows for reassembly. So your body takes what it needs and then makes you rearranges to make the proteins that it needs. All right, so functions of protein. They act as structural components in the body. They build and maintain the body. I want you to remember that. They're found in many enzymes and hormones and all antibodies. They transport iron, fat, minerals, and oxygen. They maintain fluid and acid-base balance. They provide energy as a last resort. That is as a last resort <laughs> and helps with blood clotting. So there's a lot of functions of protein. Um, and as I've said, and I'll say later on in this uh, lecture, Yes, we uh, consume protein for help building and maintaining tissues in our body. However, eating an abundance of protein alone is not what's going to build muscles. What ha the, the way that we build muscles is by using them. So exercise, um, incorporating weightlifting as well as what builds our muscles. We'll need, uh, as we, as we uh, increase our workouts, whether that's in intensity or frequency, we may need more protein to sustain our body at that point. But if we are living a sedentary lifestyle or have very minimum, minimal uh, physical activity, then we don't need to eat excess of protein. What does our body do when it has excess of carbohydrates or excess of fat or excess of protein even? It starts to create, it starts to um, save it for later. So, when, the body, when food enters the body, your body will digest the food and utilize what it needs for energy. And when we're eating too much uh, carbohydrates, uh, protein, or fat, what our body does is it starts storing that. And so the storing that excess energy is ultimately what uh, leads to more fat accumulating onto the body. All right, so there's different kinds of vegetarians, believe it or not. There are lacto-ovo vegetarians, which means that they eat dairy and egg. Then there's lacto-vegetarians, which means they only have dairy. Then there's vegans, and this is what I want you to remember for the test. What a vegan is, is they do not eat dairy products or um, any products that come from animals. So dairy products, eggs, even some go as far as not eating honey. Um, and typically, eating vegan or why becoming vegetarian, it varies. Sometimes health benefits, uh, they're thinking about the planet, sustainability, economics, ethics, or religious beliefs. So, um, vegans can be uh, differentiated from those who eat a plant-based diet. If you're someone, let's say, who doesn't eat dairy and eggs, but you do have honey, or um, you eat a plant-based diet, but you don't maybe necessarily have like the ethical side of things, then you could say that instead of saying vegan. It's totally up to you. But what I want you to remember for the test is that vegans do not eat dairy and they do not eat eggs. So this is very important and will show up on the test. Can vegetarian diets be nutritionally adequate? Yes, when appropriately planned, varied, and adequate in calories and um, nutrient sources. So again, making sure they're getting proper vitamins and minerals from their foods or supplementing if they need to and making sure that they're making complementary proteins so that way they're getting complete proteins um, by providing a variety of plant sources of protein in their, bot in their diet. Um, most vegetarian diets have enough protein and their di diets are lower in fat and saturated fat. So that is, um, some people become vegetarian for a health benefit. One thing to watch out for though is that um, if, if somebody as a vegetarian is not eating an adequate amount of um, complete proteins and enough fruits and vegetables, um, then they may become nutrient deficient. Um, the typical nutrient deficiencies we see are B uh, vitamin B12, um, vitamin D, calcium, iron, zinc, and omega-3 fatty acids. So these, um, these deficiencies won't occur if a person is being sure to have a variety of, in, their in their diet. Um, and you can see the sources, examples of food sources that contain these nutrients. Um, these are just some examples. There are other foods that contain these um, vitamins and minerals. 
Uh, additionally, if a person is going vegetarian or vegan, it wouldn't hurt to, to take a multivitamin, um, but it's just remembering to make sure that that becomes part of their routine and or part of, um, and that they don't like feel burnt out from taking a supplement. So it will depend, maybe um, depending on working with their doctor, maybe they'd only have to supplement once a week. I'm not, uh, that would be, they would have to get blood work done to see about that. Um, but that's only, that's only if vegetarians or vegans are not having a variety, varied diet and, um, not eating nutrient dense food. So, um, but it is possible to not be nutrient deficient and be vegetarian or vegan. So what do vegetarians eat in place of meat and milk? We've kind of gone over this, but just to reiterate, vegetarian here, when we're using this term, in this slide, we are referring to someone who maybe has dairy and eggs. So um, here are some examples of foods that they can eat. And these the list that you're seeing here is an equivalent to the amount of protein found in one ounce of meat, poultry, or fish. So that's it's a nice little comparison. Um, additionally, uh, if somebody is eating meat substitutes or meat alternatives, which are typically soy or vegetable based, um, they sometimes are fortified with nutrients such as B12. So sometimes that's how vegetarians get those nutrients as well. Okay, so if you're thinking about planning a vegetarian uh, menu, um, these are some tips. Uh, use a variety of plant proteins at each meal. So again, referring back to table 5.2 um, for getting some examples. Uh, use a variety, wide variety of vegetables. Choose low fat and fat free varieties of milk and limit the use of eggs. Offer dishes made with soy bean based products and for vegan diets avoid honey or gelatin. Okay and then here are some examples of vegetarian meals from um, different countries cuisines and this can be helpful to spice up or break up the mundane maybe uh, vegetarian diet so this this is a great way to incorporate different flavors so that way foods more palatable um, and also I just always think that it's really great to see other cultures cuisines because then we can um, try different foods and see just like how how plentiful the, of uh, ways there are to prepare food and and in, even though they're vegetarian and they don't have meat you can still make them very flavorful For vegans, um, tofu, um, substitute for eggs, yes, mashed bananas, so this might be like in a recipe. Um, soy yogurt, yes, so there's also coconut yogurt, um, and then there's also such a thing as egg replacers. So it's pretty, I've never tried it. Um, I, I have made a tofu scramble, which I like. I think that that's good if you make it with the right seasonings. I use turmeric, salt and pepper, um, a little bit of cumin, a little bit of chili, and it's, it's really good. Um, and I add it to the tofu. It's, I don't know, I think it's very flavorful. Um, substitutes for dairy, so this is when you're working with vegan soy milk. Uh, rice milk isn't that n nutritious. You can use that, um, but like almond milk, soy milk, uh, cashew milk might be better options. Soy is not a terrible option, or sorry, rice milk isn't a terrible option. They just don't always have the same amount of nutrients as soy milk or almond milk provides. Um, soy cheese. Uh, one thing to be careful, uh, or not be careful, but like be aware of is that some processed vegan foods can hurt people's stomachs depending on how fibrous it is or depending on how it was made. I go back and forth. I eat a very variety diet. Sometimes I eat all meat. Sometimes I eat vegetarian. Sometimes I eat vegan. I think it's really fun to try different diets. Not like no, I never try fad diets. I just mean that I, from time to time, cycle out meat or cycle out um, dairy or cycle out eggs just so I'm get, making, when I eat vegetarian or vegan or plant-based, I tend to find that for me personally, I eat more fruits and vegetables than I would if I have just a meat-based diet. Because for me, um, when I cook any meat, it's very easy for me to feel full. Um, so I actually... Um, I'm challenged uh, on the culinary side to, you know, try new foods out and get variety in, but I'm also challenged on the nutrition side because now I have to find ways of 
um, making those uh, complete proteins and trying out different flavors um, so that so I like it it keeps it interesting and I like that it uh, challenges me to eat more fruits and vegetables on this slide is just like a fun vegetarian food pyramid. I, I really like to include it. I believe it's in your book as well. And it's just fun to think about. And it's fun to also show you how eating a vegetarian or vegan diet can be nutrient dense. So at the bottom in the table, you can see the vegans and the lacto ovo vegetarian servings per day, how many, um, how much servings they would need to fulfill a 1600 calorie diet, a 2000 calorie diet and a 2500 calorie diet per day. So that way you can see that it is doable. They just have to get a little bit more crafty and increase, um, increase the variety of food and the amount of food that they eat. So the uh, dietary recommendations are point zero, sorry, 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight um, or 0 0.36 grams of protein per pound. If you, you know, if you want to do the kilogram, you just divide a pound uh, by 2.2 and that's your kilogram weight. Um, so that is what I use with my patients and I recommend you use as well uh, because it gives you a nice, range you can go from 0 0.8 to 1.0 if you want and then as if you were someone who starts um uh lifting more weights and putting on more muscle you can then increase it to 1.2 um to 1.4 or 1.5 depending on how often you're working out how vigorously or intense the activity is and how frequent you're working out so that does depend on those things. I wouldn't say increase your protein just to increase your protein and keep in mind those percent ratios. Um, so the recommendation I believe for protein for our calories is somewhere around 15 to 20%, right? And then fat was, yesterday we went over it and I'm already forgetting, I believe was uh, 20 to 35%. And then so carbohydrates is the majority and it's 55 to 65%. So you can play around with those percentages, um, but definitely don't overdo it on the protein, especially if you're not working out. Cause like I said, that is, it's just excess energy that your body will end up storing. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again, plant sources of protein contain less fat, um, except for nuts and seeds, but the nuts and seeds have healthy fat and they have more fiber. Fiber is really great. If you remember all the way back to probably lecture one or two, um, our recommended amount of, our recommended amount of, uh, fiber can be sometimes hard to get, right? We said around 25, uh, grams of fiber. So, uh, plant increasing our plant sources of protein can be a great way to, to go about that. And then, um, surprisingly, according to uh, the Dietary Guidelines for American Studies in 2015, teen boys and adult men get too much protein and should reduce their intake of meat, poultry, and eggs. So that was really interesting, food for thought. Um, again, this is enhance our power, strength, or speed athletes. So when we say athletes, we're talking about people who are competing at a higher level um, so that's when you would increase the uh, protein intake but if you're not somebody who's working out one to two hours per day every day then that's not going to you're not going to fall into that category um, so definitely um, being mindful of that protein and amino acid supplements are rarely needed for athletes or non-athletes since they eat more um, they take in more protein so Depending on you personally, as an, if you're an athlete or non-athlete, uh, for non-athletes, I don't typically recommend, but some dietitians do because um, some of us are on the go and maybe can't have those four to six meals depending on how you break up your calorie range. So that makes sense to me. If a scoop of protein is 20 grams, then it makes sense to me that that might be easier for a snack or a, a, a small meal if you're on the go or making a smoothie with that. I'm not opposed to that. It's just something to be aware of. Obviously, if you're looking at your MyFitnessPal and you're tracking what you're eating and how much you're eating, you'll know whether or not um, you're getting enough protein or not getting enough protein. So that will be a great place to double check. So if you're maybe just a few grams short or 20 grams short, then maybe you're, you, that might be an easy fix for you rather than making an entirely new meal you might just use a protein supplement. So it's up to you. Also being aware protein supplements can be expensive. 
Um, so, but some, some are not, and I personally prefer plant-based, uh, protein supplements. Um, so, but you, you do you, I'm just not really a milk person. I never have been too much. I might be lactose intolerant. I've never gotten tested for it, but too much dairy does hurt my stomach. So I like the vegan protein, um, supplements. And if you are interested in that, let me know. And I can tell you what, um, brands I like that I've tried. So I just like to include this. You can check this athlete out. This is a vegan bodybuilder. I believe he's from Germany. Um, he's great. I believe his name's Patrick. Um, and he, I, I, I just, he's an amazing per athlete to watch compete, but he has been eating vegan for many years now. So you can see that you can still put on muscle even by eating a vegan diet. Um, dietary recommendations. This is interesting. This five ounce steak after cooking has 40 grams of protein and much of the protein you need in one day. So keeping that in mind because a lot of us aren't always paying attention to our portion sizes and aren't always aware how much protein we're getting. Uh, misconceptions of protein intake. Eating excessive protein does not result in bigger muscles or create bigger bones or pump up your immune system. I love that the book includes that. And then my personal note, only strength training and exercise will help build muscles. There are some negative effects of uh, having a high protein intake. Eating too much protein can result in too many calories taken in and thus lead to weight gain, result in high higher intake of saturated fat, which increases your risk for heart disease, which we went over in chapter four, and can put more work on the kidneys, which can lead to diet, excuse me, which can lead to kidney disease in the long run. One thing I always make sure a point to is that negative effects from high protein intake, um, long-term consumption of red meat and processed meat is strongly linked with a modest but significant increase in developing colorectal cancer. So this is a big point for me to bring up and I'll say it again, long-term consumption of red meat and processed meat is strongly linked with a modest but significant increase in the risk of developing colorectal cancer. So I say this because growing up, my diet was high in, the, in these red meats and processed meat because my family, um, we were middle class, but we weren't rich. And my parents both worked um, long hours. My stepdad worked 12 hours during the day and my mom worked 12 hours night, graveyard shift. And so my brothers and I often made food for ourselves and, you know, we didn't really know how to cook. So we always had salami sandwiches or turkey sandwiches or ham sandwiches or bologna sandwiches or um, hot dogs or just whatever was really easy for us and pizza. <laughs> and so these things um, were really hard on our bodies. Um, I know for me it was really tough on my digestive system and um, my mom had her gallbladder removed and um, when I became aware of like how hard that was on my body digesting it as I began to learning about nutrition saw that my mother had had her gallbladder removed and then one of my little brothers had his appendix removed I was like whoa this is a wake-up call and I need to really switch change my diet so that my I've been really good about not eating these um these uh, meats, red, uh, red meats and processed meats. And I know we're all in different places, but I always like to share that personal story as encouragement because like I said, for me, um, part of motivation for eating healthy and exercising is developing a, a higher quality of life and uh, longevity in life. So I always make sure that I let people know that. All right, we've gone over that, so we don't need to go through that again. We've gone over denaturation. It happens in the body, but it also happens when we cook. So the process in which proteins become firm, shrink in size, and lose moisture, and then they become, they go from, if you've ever cooked a steak, you know they're, um, they're kind of, not floppy, but I mean, they're not tough, and then once you cook them, then they do become tough. Um, so I know for me personally, I like medium, uh, cooked meat. I know my husband likes it well done, but I like the texture because it's still a little softer. <laughs> oh, and then, uh, yeah, and just on the note of denaturation, um, eggs being cooked or uh, heavy cream being whipped, um, 
is another example of denaturation. Um, chicken breasts and turkey breast, uh, meaning some pe people refer to them as white meat without the skin, are low in saturated fat. There's only about one gram of saturated fat in four ounces of chicken or turkey. So if you're a person that's like, I love meat, what do I do? How do I get protein? And like, what can I eat? Um, these are good alter healthy alternatives. Um, most fish is lower in fat as well um, and saturated fat as long as they don't have the skin on. So here are some lean cuts of beef in case any of you are like, what about the beef? What about the pork? You know, so we're going to get it. Here's some beef. We're going to talk about beef and then uh, a little bit about pork. Um, not a whole lot, but I included a couple pictures. So bottom round steak or roast, flank steak, eye round roast, top sirloin steak, tenderloin filet, um, top round roast or steak, uh, 90 10 or 95 5 ground beef. If any of these are like, wow, that's too expensive, then maybe you have to stretch the meat a little bit more. Maybe you add a little bit. You have some meat in your tacos, but you supplement with a um, incomplete plant based protein, you know, like we were talking about, like beans. Um, and you, that, that's one way to stretch. Um, your meat and then or you know trade-offs right like you like these cuts of beef but they might be more expensive so maybe you'll have beef um, every other day or you know three days out of the week instead and alternate so that way you can get these um, cuts that are lower in fat that might be a little bit more expensive and you can, or you can use my tip about stretching your meat so this is just a picture I include. Some of you may be familiar, some of you not. Um, I encourage you to take a look at these on your own time and get really familiar. So I got, um, oh, again, uh, porkinspired.com is a great resource for anyone who's interested in leaner cuts of pork or even getting to know maybe what cuts of pork are um, higher in saturated fat so you can avoid or limit your intake of those. Other lean animal protein um, that we haven't maybe talked about, uh, uh, veal, uh, uh, loin chops, uh, we've mentioned chicken breasts, but I'll, I'll say it again, <laughs> and then seafood we've talked about as well. Um, you can check out, if you're, inter if you're environmentally conscious or concerned about how our fish uh, supply is doing, you can check out the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch or Sea Choice for helping choose sustainable fish. Um, I know in Whole Foods they have a section as well where they talk about where their fish comes from and how it's raised um, or if it's wild caught, but I don't think all grocery stores have that, so it would be great to check that out in case you were curious. So just a couple questions to think about. On your own time I know that I lecture quite a bit and I if we were in person I would not be lecturing so much we'd actually have a really great dialogue and we have a lot of conversation so I'm sorry that we're not getting it with um, on this online version but some things to think about are what are some healthy cooking methods for meat poultry or fish so I'm asking you this question and what are some healthy ways to incorporate protein into the diet so these are some questions just to be thinking about, and if you ever want to ask me questions, I'm always around, or if you'd like to pose these questions to me to see my answer, then I'm also more than happy to do that. And uh, just a note on conversations too, as I said in, I believe it was week one of my announcements, if you ever want to do a Google Hangout, a virtual live uh, video chat, if you want to get to know me or you have questions about the material or questions about the course in general, like I said then and I'll say it again, uh, we can most certainly make that happen. I would be more than happy to do that. Um, I'm always here for my students. I know that it doesn't feel like that because we're virtual uh, as far as class goes, but we can make it happen. It's a little bit of an adjustment, but I'm always willing to do that. Just some ideas for preparing uh, proteins. You can use rubs and marinades to give the meat more flavor. Um, these help build, uh, uh, or sorry, wet or dry, sorry. So the, um, and a lot of you probably know this, um, but I just include this as well in case you were interested. Uh, rub typic rubs can be wet or dry, but typically rub is, it's typically dry and then marinades are typically wet, but you can play around with that as much as you like. And then just some ideas for preparing cooking fish and shellfish. 
uh, marinate without citrus, yes. Um, I personally like ceviche, so maybe that's something that you have tried or want to try. Um, you can try marinating. Oh, I really like, have you ever had, what is it called? It's like blackened fish, and it's really cool because you use different um, different spices and seasonings. I, I really like that. It gives it a really nice flavor. And then here are some great cooking methods, kind of going back to that question I asked you. Rather than frying, we can roast, grill, broil, saute, poach, and braise. So that would have been my answer to the question that I posed to you. And now you know my answer, so maybe you'll incorporate those cooking methods if you don't already um, into your repertoire. <laughs> and smoking can also add flavor, although I haven't done research lately on... If there are any risks associated, health risks associated with smoking our meats, I need to look into that. Um, this is just talking about menu and presentation. Presentation. So if you're working in a restaurant or thinking about working in your restaurant, then you know that menu and presentation is very important. Um, so just thinking, keeping those things in mind as well. You can incorporate. Um, you can make foods healthier. I should say you can make dishes healthier. You can make your menu healthier, but. Um, one thing that can help is making the food flavorful in different ways other than relying on fat to flavor the food or heavy salt. Uh, you have to get more creative. We talk about it a little bit uh, right now, but we're going to talk about it more so in the uh, chapters to come. And then I always like to uh, share this. I had mentioned a couple of, ch I think in chapter two, when we first talked about my plate that I like to show the Harvard healthy plate eating plate. Um, so I like this because it takes my plate to the next level. There are some different versions, or sorry, there's different variations. And I would typically ask you, what are the differences between my plate and Harvard healthy eating plate? So Harvard healthy eating plate, you'll see they have water. They've swapped out the, the dairy section for water. Um, you can most certainly have dairy. It's just incorporated, um, in this category so what i like is that so for example water it says drink water to your coffee because we're talking about hydration with little or no sugar limit milk or dairy to one to two servings per day so dairy is still there it just tells you how many servings to get and then if you are going to have juice try to keep it to one small glass per day and avoid sugary drinks so what i like about harvard a healthy eating plate is that it is still simple but it does include some further explanations so um I'm going to read the rest of it and then feel free to check it out on your own. Feel free to ask me questions. And um, I prefer this. I like this much more than my plate. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so eat whole grains like brown rice, whole wheat bread, and whole grain pasta. Limit refined grains like white rice and white bread. Choose fish, poultry, and beans as part of your healthy protein. And nuts, limit red meat. Avoid baking, cold cuts, and other processed meats. Eat plenty of fruits of all colors. The more veggies and the greater the variety, the better. Potatoes and french fries don't count. I like that it includes that. Um, use healthy oils like olive, like olive and canola oil for cooking and putting on salad and at the table. Limit butter and avoid trans fat. Stay active. So I include this at the end of chapter 5 as a summary. It's a nice recap of everything that we've been talking about from chapters 1 through 5. And I like that it's right here. So as you're studying, maybe using this as your summary guide. Um, because what I like to do too, which we're not together, but if we were, I'm a very much big picture. And then we go into the details of the smaller pictures within the big picture. And then we end with the big picture. I hope that was helpful. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. I'm always here for you. Thank you so much again for listening. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and week.